chairs. If you could take a chair with you, that would be a huge help as well. Um, I don't need to introduce Reb Solomon. I'm sure you all know him. He is our World Wisdom Chair holder, Professor Emeritus of Religion at Temple University, and a strong case for true benevolence in this world that we live in. So without further ado, Reb Solomon Shakti Shalomi. to do with the number of problems that we as human beings have to solve now. In other words, the vision has got to be so big as to what needs to be done in order that we might survive, that to stay totally open to all that input that comes deep in meditation, oof, wake up, you've got to do something about this. So all, all the time we have a clamor, an emotional clamor in us that wants us to become aware. Now it turns out, and here's a statistic 
that shocked me when I heard it, that about 45% of our people are suffering from depression. Now, you would say 5%, 10% of our people are suffering from depression. I would say that's due to the fact they have the cyclotimic, you know, thing, and the, as genetic as this is that. I can't imagine that here we're dealing with a genetic problem. We're dealing with an environmental problem. So that the environment in which we live is not a good environment. And it calls on us to do something and it's causing us to clean up the act. And this is what this sign on the forehead wants to signify. Uh, it's a wonderful story about the Nachman of Braslov that has something to do with the sign on the forehead. They told the king that the next harvest would have a wheat the only wheat that would be available is such that would make people go mad, go crazy. And so the next year was, you know, people had the choice either going crazy or not eating. So the king called his visor and said to him, what do you suppose we should do about that? And he said, let's gather as much as we can of uncontaminated wheat and then we'll see what happens. They just found enough for one person for a year. So the Bible said, Your Majesty, you were that. No, the king said, If I were to not eat from that wheat, I wouldn't understand my subjects. <laughs> I too have to be crazy this year. But all year we're going to go around with a sign on our forehead. And it's your job going to be not to eat of that wheat, but to eat of the one that we have saved for you. And you go around and tell us, don't forget you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say that we need to say to each other, don't forget that there is so much stuff that needs doing and not enough time to do it in. And the feeling of social fibers that have been cut so, so small that we don't feel how we're going to make this, this massive change that's called upon to do. No wonder we feel depressed. One of our Hasidic masters says, that's a good time, depression. Don't try to get out of it. In fact, increase it. Usually, depression has something to do with not wanting to know something. <laughs> you know. And it's depressing when that keeps on pushing that which I'm about to deny. I, don't, I really don't want to know of it. It's like the phone is ringing, the phone is ringing, and I don't want to pick it up, but it's getting me down, but it still is ringing. So he suggests that the best thing that you could do under those circumstances is to really start looking. It's, it's as if your body is calling you to pay attention to what needs fixing. And if you uh, get to listen to that, you'll get more depressed. But you know what, you'll get out of it afterwards. And if you try and keep yourself from being depressed and dealing with depression, it's going to last a lot longer, and you won't be able to do anything. It's going to go against what your body is trying to tell you. And so I want to begin with this notion of what needs fixing. Because underneath this dysfunctionality that uh, is in the world, there is an urge towards something better. And now comes the question, how are we going to read this pressure? Will we read the pressure saying, the reason why you are in trouble is because you did something wrong? What do you do if you did something wrong? You try to fix it. So in many religious systems, you have sacraments of penance. There are some seats up front here. The sacraments of reconciliation, it's a way of saying, 
that I'm going to say it sort of in a, almost in a funny way. The religion that gives you the guilt also gives you a means to deal with it. <laughs> and so the sacrament of penance and the way in which you work with that is to say there is a process and this process that goes between guilt and the response to that is what kicks the soul into growing. You wouldn't get to grow if you always felt nice and graced. You know? Later on we're going to get to a type, to a kind of a phase in human development where people like to have that, that attitude, always nice and good. So there are two responses to the feeling of malaise. One response is to say we did something wrong and we are going to go and check in the resources available in our tradition to see how we right that wrong. Okay. And that's how the whole theology of penance is filled with ways of saying, how do you right the wrong that you have done? Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, it is my sin, ashamnu bagadu, when we confess our sins. And therefore, we fulfill what is written in the Book of Lamentation. Let us go and see where it is, what we have done wrong. We will look our, over our ways and we will search them and we will return to God to see how far did I get off the path and then by using a way to recalibrate myself so that I should be on the path, I'm going back to that path. Underline the word back. There is another possibility not that the malaise is caused because we have diverted from the path and gone wrong. There is another possibility. We have outgrown the old path. It is possible, you know. Uh, when I was a child, I was doing childish things, you know, as uh, Paul talks about it. And then I go and have to transcend it, I have to go out of that. And as I grow out of that, I see that there are new orders necessary, that I cannot go in the old path because I had to grow out of the old path. The old path was no longer fitting for the flow of time, for the texture of the time that is the time in which we live today. So that one sees it not that we have gone wrong, but that we have outgrown. Now, I believe the truth is somewhere between the two. <laughs> you know, it's also pretty clear that we have gone wrong, that we have done some things that, that, that didn't work. We shouldn't have done them. They were, what's the wonderful, gentle way in which uh, His Holiness never says, this is bad. He says, not very useful. <laughs> So we have we've gotten to, to some things that need fixing because the way in which we are doing it is not very useful. But on the other hand, we also see the crisis that various traditions, religions are undergoing because the old reality map doesn't fit anymore and the old attitudes that we have don't fit anymore and we're going to explore some of these in greater detail. When we look at issues that have to do with ecumenism. Do, do religions have to fight with each other? If I belong to this one, have, do I have to be against the other? Or has something else happened? Has there been a change? I'm sure there's been a change, at least in this group that's sitting here. I don't think there's anybody here who would say, my religion is über alles, my, you know, and mine has to win and all the others have to go down the tubes. So I can't believe that, we, that this, is, this is our group here. So then the question keeps coming up, but yeah, but how, without diluting who I am and, and what I have to do, how can I relate in such a way that there won't be diluting going on? Big question. 
so we're going to explore that. But today I'd like to especially look at the two responses to the Malays. One response is, let's go back and restore things as they used to be, because then they used to work. I'm not so sure. <laughs> uh, but we have this nice filter that filters out all the bad, so we have good old days. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, none of us would want the plumbing in midwinter that we used to have a hundred years ago, when everything was so wonderful. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm not worried about that. Let's take a look and see how this comes out. Want to press that switch there? That red switch. Thank you. And look at a couple of words here. <coughs> I'm going to read restoration. <coughs> now you see the typeface I used for that. <laughs> um, I wanted to make sure that we are clear that this is all English. <laughs> uh, and, but it does not only belong to one group. Each group has a script. You would see that there is modern Hebrew script and then there's a script that is in the scroll. And by using the script of the scroll, you are saying something. The typeface reveals the climate from which it comes. Notice the sentence in, taken from Deuteronomy. Add not thereunto, nor subtract. You know, Keep the law as it is. It has to remain like rock of ages and, and not move. So restoration looks to the past and wants to replicate the past faithfully. It is architectural. In other words, it sees everything like a, a building, like a cathedral, in which it was saved. And this is meant to last. You know, cathedrals were not built for a short time. So, <clears throat> so it is with theology. Once the theology is given, it is architectural. This is the dogma that we believe in. And these are the, the, the articles of faith. And they were so as it was in the beginning, so it is now and ever shall be world without end. So you hear that, that, that attitude. It looks to the past. It wants to replicate the past faithfully. It's architectural. It's inert. It does not want things to move. It looks for the status quo. It is static. It's fixed. It's unvarying. What you see is all there is to it. <laughs> and it's unmystical. The Torah once given at Sinai was for all times, for all Jews, under all conditions. And when you come with this big statement, all times, you know, all Jews, Ashkenazim, Sephardim, Litvakis, Galician, the whole range of possibilities, but all of them have to do it the same way. That's the, the attitude of restoration. So now comes renewal, and renewal says, it's not only because we did wrong, God, it's not, that's not the whole story. The whole story is that we outgrew where we were before. And therefore, we have to renew, and renewal is not merely the same restoration. What is, it, what is it like? It's volatile. I can't renew if I want to be static. You know, the very fact of renewal and the way in which I get other people to renew is precisely in that that I will stimulate by my attunement other people to the same attunement who also will then start to move along renewal. It's in flux, it's multi-level. If you try and say, this is nothing but, in other words, in a reductive way, that's not the way renewal goes about it. It says, it's this and that and that and that. It depends where we go to what, to what uh, universe of discourse. It's dynamic. It has notions organically relating to the environment. It's growing. It says, I'm not perfect yet. In fact, I'm growing toward that. Do I have all the answers? No, I don't have all the answers. Do I seek the answers? Yes. I'm constantly learning. I'm dissatisfied with the status quo. And renewal seeks to transform self and others, to strive for a better future. And here comes another sentence of the Bible. And it shall be on that day all these wonderful prophecies that promise us something good, that God will be one, his name will be one, the wolf and the lion will 
uh, the lab and the lion, the lion together. Uh, we walked to the lion for next door in the zoo. <laughs> So we have looked at this, and we see that renewal is another response. Now I've got to look at my notes. <laughs> so let's look at the way in which both renewal and restoration, look at the process of making the change that is necessary so we would be with what urges us to get it straightened up. I've been looking for a term and asked my colleagues here, is there such a term in Tibetan Buddhism or in Theravadan Buddhism that deals with the issue of teshuva, which gets translated as repentance, which gets translated as metanoia with the Greek word, gets translated as tauba in Arabic. It all has the sense in which it goes, turn back, turn back, turn back. I go back because I'm being called back. Return, O ye wayward children. And so you have the, the word, to return, to come back, to come home, as it were. <clears throat> and then, often the question is raised, how do you do that? Because every spiritual director who has ever guided souls in their path to God, to the light, has experienced that, that people come and say, so tell me something useful. What are the tools that I can use in order to bring this about? What are the skillful means that I have to use? What are the upaya that I have to use in order to make that process work for me? And so there is an element of imparting of teaching that's going on between the mentor, the spiritual director, and the person who follows that. And then later on, people write these things into manuals. And so we now have manuals dealing with teshuva in Judaism, Christianity, and in Islam. All of them are talking that I'm, I'm, I know about, but I'm also very sure that such exists in Buddhism. I don't know their terms and, and the seat in that situation, and I'm sure I'll be told and that'll be good. This <laughs> process of, of how to do it in order to, to change has certain parts in it. One of them is <clears throat> well, it's like AA. I think it's the fourth step. Make a fearless review of your life. See how you, what is good with you, what is not good with you. Get it so clear that you have a full picture. It's making make an audit of yourself. Make an examination of conscience. Go into yourself, see, see how you are. And interestingly enough, uh, we may put our face in the direction of saying, nothing wrong with me. But on the inside, we can hear the voice. And so we get to recalibrate it. We go inside and we're checking out, doing our examination of conscience. And today with the tools of psychology and the words of psychology, you know, it's so wonderful what we can do. I want to say, if we don't reach enlightenment this lifetime, you're stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the tools, the tools that are available to us. I remember this little book, A Lazy Man's Guide to Enlightenment. Remember that book? Yeah. Uh, so the, the notion is we, we can do it. There's so many wonderful ways to do it. So imagine for a moment, I'm trying to do my examination of conscience. And I get to feel, yeah, there are a couple of things that have charge in them, that are really incomplete. First, I go to my hurts, you know, 
and that's, that's the easiest path inside to see what's not so happy and the examination of conscience very quickly swings to that. And I look at my hurts and I can play them back in my mind. And I can see what is incomplete. And I can now do a gestalt flip in my head and say, what would it have been like for me to be the other, for the other to be me, and if that same thing has happened between us, just with our persons reversed, how would that have impacted on me? And I get here the skillful means to do what the Bible says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's just pursuing this, making this flip, and I get to see, ah, yeah. And that creates equity between people, and so there's a whole set of tools, I can't go into them all right now, but there's a whole set of tools that are available to us to do this purgation. And I recall that almost every year, both Catholics and Anglicans would publish uh, Lenten books, which were sort of things that you could take home with you and follow day by day in the process of getting closer to uh, Easter. We have this in Judaism when we count to 49 days after Passover to the receiving of the Torah, and each day is a day of further working on oneself to a particular thing inside that one needs to work on. So it's a wonderful process. The people who are into restoration, did you see the Apostle? Let's see how many of you have seen that. Thing. Well, the amazing thing in that movie was the way in which they allowed us to look into the heart of someone who lives that way. Uh, how prayer was not something that was done, let us pray, bow our head, and mouth these words. It was something that, remember that wonderful scene where he gets so angry at God. He said, I love you, but I really, you know, I'm mad at you. But you couldn't help but see that this person was in a vital relationship with God, that this was a real, a real relationship for him. And when he is going out in despair, I, haven't, I don't hear you anymore, you don't guide me anymore, what am I going to do? You have seen uh, the, the painful way of transformation in a person. And you can see, this was a, I would say, recommend this movie for as Linton <laughs> uh, work. So that one could see somebody who's working on oneself uh, and gets better. By the way, the movies have been showing us a lot of pictures like that. Goodwill hunting. You know, taking someone through that process where a shift and change can take place. So it's as if the media themselves are being used by Mother Earth to uh, wake us up and to, to shift us into, into such a direction. That's the wonderful part that is in fundamentalism. People who are saying it is wrong where we are, we are not doing it right, and you know what? I agree with most of the questions that the fundamentalists ask. I disagree with the answers <laughs> they offer, but do you understand? Very often when we liberals, we liberals yes, take the attitude, we can't listen to, to those fundamentalists, and we don't want to hear what they have to say, and they're all wrong, we miss a great deal about not listening to the questions that they ask, because the questions they ask makes us also anxious, and we are trying not to not have to think about it, so it depresses us more and so on. So, the questions are good questions. How does one deal with them? And now I'm going to shift to something else that's going to be very important for us to understand. Can we have the next? <clears throat> I tell you a story, a sort of a confession I'm making right now. That's the one. On, um, how would I say, my fundamentalism. In 1950, um, Dr. Carl Stern, who had studied with Buber 
and uh, uh, was born Jewish and lived in Frankfurt and had the best teachers. He couldn't say he went to a bad Hebrew school. He had the best teachers, Rosenzweig and Buber. And he came to America and got acquainted with Jacques and Risa Maritain and turned Catholic and wrote a book called The Pillar of Fire. I read the book and I was between wanting to throw the book into a furnace or running to the next priest and say, baptize me too. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand? It was a, a very powerful, the, the guy is a psychiatrist. Uh, so he knows what he's doing. He wrote this book and I was upset and, and, and stirred and all that stuff. Years later, I'm in Canada and I see somebody interviewing a guy on uh, TV. The interviewer is, I think, a bully. And the guy who's trying to answer is a gentleman. And every time he begins an answer and talks, it make, starts making sense. The bully interrupts him with another question. I get so angry. I'm going to write to this guy. This is not to the way you interview things. But I want to know whom he interviewed. Now, in the meantime, somebody had sent me a note, asked me for the address of Dr. Carl Stern, and I had written back, uh, I, I think I heard that he died. So there flashes on the screen, the person being interviewed is with a live program is Dr. Carl Stern of St. Mary's Hospital in, uh, in uh, Montreal. So I write him a letter, give him the address of the person who had inquired about him, and say, you're a psychiatrist, I don't need to tell you uh, uh, why I thought you were dead. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> having heard you, but having heard you how, how you spoke and how, how much sense you made, I ask you to please give me a chance to come and visit you. I'd like to talk with you. He writes back, come and see me, and so he gives me a time in the hospital. I come there, and there were some nice illuminated manuscripts from uh, the books um, from missiles or hours there. And so I look around at these things and he greets me and we have a wonderful conversation and about the end of the time when I'm talking with him, it's time to go. I say to him, we shake hands, I say to him, Dr. Stern, now that the honeymoon is over, how does it feel? Now that was supposed to be a dirty dig, <laughs> you know? In other words, the last bit of what was sitting in my crop. He still holds my hand and he says, you know what, it's a good question, I forgive you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so, so beautiful. I, I forgive you. And it's a good question. Sit down, calls the secretary and says, I need a few more minutes. And this is what he showed me. Look at this from the bottom up. Freud in the stages of psychosexual development is talking how the first stage is we are born, we are oral. All our, everything's around the mouth and about sucking and, and eating and taking it all in. And as we grow up, there is the next development that libido, as it were, the seed of, of, of libido moves away from the oral place and now I become a lot more receptive to my jollies, yeah? What turns me on? By having control. I'm going, see, mommy, I didn't do it all over the place. I, I made it in a potty. Everything that we learn during that phase has to do with learning control, dealing with the environment that way. There is another stage where, which he calls the phallic stage. Everything pa passes on now. I'm beyond control. But now I'm beginning to understand how patterns are, how things fit together, how symbols stand for something, and I get interested in the pleasure that I'm getting from genitals. But this is what I do with myself alone, and it is almost as if the polymorphous thing that happens, in other words, the total sexuality gets more and more concentrated symbolically, not on genitals. Then, 
Pardon? Same way, but he just put in the clitoris, all right? <laughs> uh, but he, that's how he talked. Freud didn't, you know, it took Anna Freud to start talking about what women are going to Papa Freud, he, he was talking about women have penis envy. Um, if he had been a papa watching the nursing of a child, he would have breast envy. <laughs> you know? uh, so anyway, I, I'm not going to go into that one. <laughs> but he points out that as we grow, we get to the place where after that, our attachments are being made to the gang. Heart of my heart, I love that melody, you know, hanging out with my buddies, and this is, this is so good because my brothers and, and sisters are, are nasty to me, but my gang, oh, how we love each other. We're going to be friends forever, and so on and so forth. We, a drop of blood from me, a drop of blood from you, I mean, all this stuff. Only later on, Freud talks about we get into genital, uh, the genital stage, and then we are ready for the internet. Okay. Now he didn't have to give me that whole intro because the five stages were right there. I got it. But then he said, "Let me show you something. A person gets involved in something of the spirit, and religion, and a path. The first thing feels so good." the land of milk and honey. I have now found my place. This is what will nurture the longing of my soul. This is where I'm going to stay. And it's wonderful. Does it last forever? No, it doesn't last forever. And pretty soon that path will begin to make discipline demands. Saying, you have to discipline your mind, your breath, your this is how you're going to sit. These are the prayers you have to recite. These are the things you will eat, the other things you will not eat. I mean, you see a whole bunch of things start coming down as to how do you incorporate that. And there are a number of people uh, who don't like it. Just like a child will say, I don't like the fact that you want to even have control of something that I barely can control. It's mine! You know? <laughs> So what, what right have you got in the whole, there's a lot of protest in, in that name, part two. And it says, therefore everybody who doesn't do it the right way is wrong, you know, and there's a bad judgment. Don't be a bad boy, don't do it. You see, as we use the means of anger against part of ourselves in order to gain control, what happens is most of that gets projected on other people. And we begin to see, see, he isn't so clean. See, he isn't, I'm, I'm a goody-goody. And he isn't so clean. So there are the strict observances of the rules that start coming in when we get into the anal phase. After a while, enough already, you know, it's time to throw the book away. Yes, you've been told that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. But you have been told this, and I tell you it is deeper than that. You get that sense that there is an introduction of another level of understanding that says, it's not the thing, it's just, it stands for something. Holding the bread, the matzah, and saying, this is my body. Can you transfer what you're thinking about when you think, about matzah now to a whole other, to a whole other idea. Do you see what, what a meaning giving, symbol making is what comes out of that and says, it isn't in the rules, it is beyond the rules. Something, you have to do something much deeper. And what we do here reverberates to the highest places and changes the world. So therefore, we will meet in, in, in this monastery, and seven times a day are we going to praise God in those canonical hours in order to make sure that somewhere, somehow, someone will keep that story going. And it isn't what we are doing, it is that great story, the greatest story ever told. So you get that, that, that notion behind it. It is so symbolic. Uh, everything that's been written about the Passover celebration, why do we eat this matzah? It's the bread of affliction our forefathers ate in Egypt. 
remember that you were slaves in Egypt and no one else has to be a slave anymore. You have to help people to their liberation. So you see that the, the, the symbols get now transformed into something as if they were pointing the way. And even the word Torah means casting, like pointing the way. So, symbols, mythic. And then it happens that a person gets very excited about the social gospel. I said, listen, all those sacraments and all the kind of stuff, you know, that's fluff. What's for real is people are hungry, you know. You've got to go out and do something. You have to check your community. Your community is not a loving community. You haven't encountered the shadow of your community. You haven't really become true community, as Pe uh, Scott Peck is pointing out. You really have to get to this place because this is where the salvation of the world is in in working on the social order and becoming really all of us to be, and that's called the latency period in Freud and in religion. It is the move from the symbolic to tikkun olam, to fixing the world. Then, he says, just as Freud is talking about genital intimacy, there are some people who have made it through this compassionate concern for the world order and then they outgrow that too, working further. And then nothing will satisfy but to be in this constant communion with the one who creates, sustains the universe. And, and, and to know oneself as being part of that one. <coughs> so that's the unitive monistic point of the way. Now he did this in less than five minutes telling me quickly those stages. But then he said, and I'm here now. And he pointed to the place, he says, now I get, I'm in connection very strong with little Therese of Ligier, and I am dealing with, she's known as the little flower, she likes roses, and, he, and uh, decorating the, uh, the home altar, doing all these things are very, very important. So you get a sense of people who are doing puja, you know, working on the murtis, just how that feels like this is so important, needs to be done, and it reaches the highest heavens at that time. So, he says, I'm here. So, thank you very much. I hope we meet again. <laughs> uh, so, we did meet again subsequently. And this teaching that he gave me here is very important. Now, let's go back and see what happens when we get to this place of the anal strict observance of rules. First of all, what does it say in the Bible? You get it? Uh, you f can you feel yourself? Make yourself for a moment really tight ask, okay? <laughs> get that sense? Do you feel that in your body right now? Now I want to see what's written in the Bible. <laughs> and you see how every other meaning that the word might have has gone. Right now I want to see what's written in that, in that their Bible. That sense that it comes with this. And I'm not making fun of it because I experience that at times. I experience that when I get into this place. It's these, these things are dynamic. It's up and down. You know, I wish I was always on, on those higher planes. But from time to time, what gets me out of where I have to get out is that business of the anal religion stuff that says, watch out, this is what you have to do and, and be precise. And then when I start looking up the law, I want to see what are the limits, what, what's meant, where are the boundaries of that? Because this attitude deals a lot with boundary. It wants to set them really clear and sharp. It, it likes digital better than it likes analog. See? In analog, you make copies and they get weaker and weaker. Digital always give you the same wonderful clarity. <laughs> so it means like, as Moses said it, you know, or, or as it is written in the Bible, so I know. I don't want to know these questions when, for instance, I point out, was the Bible given in English in the King James Version? <laughs> you know, or in the Vulgate or, or whatever, you know, and it's, I want to talk to people about history and the translations and they don't want to hear. I believe in the inerrancy of the Bible 
if I'm going to mess around with any of these things, I'm not going to get it straight. There's only one way to get it straight. So let me read it as it's written in the book and do it like it's written in the book because otherwise I drown in doubt, I drown in confusion. My only clarity is there. Thou who changest not abide with me. You know, lead kindly lie them in encircling gloom. Uh, lead thou me on. Or even if it is a cross that lifts me, you know, nearer my God to thee. You get that sense? I, I'm going to take on what I need to take on. It's going to be difficult, and I'm going to do it this way, and I'm going to look for those limits, and let me see what it's like if I don't cut corners. I'm sure you have experienced that. Ah, uh, if it were only so simple. Then come two people reading the same text and not agreeing. And so it happened about a century ago that you had a proliferation of denominations right here on this continent. They were going crazy. This was the Baptist church, but then they split between Seventh-day Baptists and First-day Baptists, those who kept it on Sunday, those who kept it on Saturday. Then there was a question whether, are you a free willer or a predestinarian? So they asked these kinds of questions. And do you, are you being baptized into the Father and, to, and the Son, or, you know, in the Father and the Son? And I belong to one of those churches, and we really, really disagree about this very hard. I forgot which one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke about the time of those many denominations. But it was, could you understand how important it was in a time of flux that people would like to have something that they could hold on to? But then, in all the questions of interpretation, there is a splintering until finally, deep down, you're a denomination of one. And if you were to check that out, you also have a split inside going on. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I look at, at the problem that the promise keepers want to solve. And I want to say it's a great problem. Many of us would be able to sing, sometimes I feel like a fatherless child, you know? Uh, we didn't have that strong guidance. We, uh, we don't respect our father. You know, Willie Lomax kids, what, what, how would they think about their father? So we, we don't want to be these kinds of fathers for our children. So we're going to get together in the stadium, and we're going to make this promise, and we're going to straighten up, and we're going to do it the right way, and we're going to listen to the Word of God because there's nobody else that we can listen to. Even the ministers may be corrupt, but the only thing that is not corrupt is the Word of God as it's written in this Bible. So you get to see how people are looking for a mooring in order to be able to do it. I could, I'm talking today about uh, fundamentalism as if this is a good option, but I want to tell you I don't buy it myself. <laughs> so, but I must understand, uh, this is a, a, a teaching I got from Mark Gerson, uh, who wrote this amazing book, A House Divided, is it? A Home yeah. House I Divided. Divided. Yeah, in which he describes people who are living this kind of life and in an open, sympathetic way as to not to put it down. So now I come to the issue of renewal. Instead of being pushed by the past, people who are interested in renewal say, first of all, let's not forget what the condition was. It is not because we have done something so terribly wrong, it is because we have outgrown the old. And if we have, as we checked last week, that we have gone through a number of technologies and that every one of those technologies that we went through reflected a stage of, in our de religious development, and now we are coming to something that's global. None of the other predecessors that we had in our lineages had seen even a picture of what Earth looks from outer space. 
Now, I don't know if, you know, we, we lived in, through this thing, and so we, we have taken it for granted, but I don't know if you realize what kind of fantastic shift has taken place in consciousness when this event happened, the Earth seen from outer space. And look at how our ecological consciousness has taken more and more of our awareness. It's, it's, it's building in concerns that we have about that. And it's because it's almost as if Earth looking in the mirror and saying, Oi, don't, I don't look so good. <laughs> <laughs> and giving us the message back and saying at the same time, but I'm so beautiful, I'm so glorious, look how blue I am. You know, look, look, look. All the others are barren. The moon is barren. Mars is barren. Too. You know, Jupiter doesn't have this kind of life. Look how beautiful I am. This myth that is coming into our heart and begins to grow is so powerful that it has given us a sense of uh, allegiance a lot more than to any symbol that we can see, than to any religious symbol, is that symbol of Earth and outer space. I think there is no stronger symbol that, that demands my allegiance and attention as this one does. So, with that, something has changed. And beginning to, how do we collaborate with that change? So instead of looking as to what was pushing us from the past, we start looking now what is pulling us from the future. Um, if I only get propelled by the past, it's like driving by the rearview mirror. If I want to look ahead, I have to, to take a look and see what's coming up next for us and what do we need to prepare for. I can't read the Bible about how the Egyptians uh, had the plagues without looking at El Nino uh, and the news that we get from both coasts um, of our country today because, because it's not so good and that they couldn't come to a better agreement that Tokyo feels like, that this, this was wrong, you know? Partly, all, all this, this stuff is coming up to us, and it says you have to do something, you have to change. So then the question is, all right, how do you go about ha doing this change? I'm not going to look through the rearview mirror. I'm going to look ahead. But after all, isn't it also necessary to sometimes look at the side mirror, the rearview mirror, or else you have all kinds of collisions? Because what you see through the through the uh, front and the front is so vast, it's so big. I need to get my bearings by looking back from time to time. So now we look at, at all the wonderful texts that we have, and we are faced with a situation. How are we going to read them? So the renewalist says, "I tell you what. If I get to understand, Professor Heschel liked to put it this way. He says." We have a wonderful answer in the Torah. We forgot the question. <laughs> he said, if we still knew what the question was, then, then we would know how to apply the answer. For years later on, I gave exams uh, to the students in uh, Temple University by providing answers and asking them to write an essay of what the question was. You know, because that would show me you couldn't cram for that, you know. <laughs> it was something that you had to really reflect on and bring to bear whatever you had learned, because that, that's the way to get to it. So we have to find out what are the questions, and then bring those questions back to the past, and ask what questions did they ask, and what conditions did they want to deal with, because, you see, there is something wonderful in civilization and having a past, even in evolution. Look how much we have learned. We have learned to become human beings and not to stay dinosaurs. Now, isn't that wonderful, right? So something is happening in the long run and all the stuff from the past accumulating and teaching us something. So we have to go back to the past and start looking. What was it that they needed to accomplish then? How did they do it? And learn not from the products they used at that time, but the processes they, that they used, because we're still human beings, and some of these processes still work, and something does work for people when they fast, and something does work for people when they have a vigil, and when they are in a hermitage, and, and spend some alone time. So all these wonderful things that we got from the past may still have something there. And when I start looking how much of the uh, 
wonderful things people had in the past and how they're lost. Today I got sort of my Catholic feel because of, of uh, Ash Wednesday. I was starting to think, you know, if one could go and ask Grandma, who came from Sicily, or from Poland, what are the things that you do? And she would start telling, there's a novena, you know, and there's this kind of vigil, and there's a retreat that you make, and I do the rosary, uh, uh, and I go for, for confession, and so on and so forth. There's a whole bunch of things that happen. And even in liturgy, there were so many more ways in which things were celebrated. Today, they're reduced to one mass. Do, do you see what I'm saying? We, uh, the palette that we had with many colors of possibilities is empty. And so this is why it's so important for us to research that wonderful library of past rituals and learn from them and, and see, get groups together and start saying, let's try this out and see what it does and then we can see how we can adapt it to our needs. And so it is that in every religion there are some people who feel that urge for renewal. In Catholicism, the latest case that you had uh, was that of Matthew Fox. Uh, and uh, he was moving too fast for the slowpoke Vatican <laughs> uh, of coming into the 21st century. But it's inevitable. Sooner or later, they're going to get there. Sooner or later, women will be ordained. Sooner or later, these things will have to happen because they have to happen. And they'll learn how to do it if they want to stay in business. And <laughs> Judaism is the same way. Orthodox people will have to learn in order if they want to stay in business and have another generation. And all of them have to learn. And you can understand how this having to learn creates such a panic in them because they would have to let go of those things that they're so sure of. And this panic makes them move more and more into fundamentalism as if, if we only tried hard enough, we would be able to make a change. The renewalist says, you're going to wear yourself out trying to do it. Energies could be applied in a much different way. Do you have all the answers? No. But you know what? I can look across the fence and see, because I've seen lately, the Buddhists have some answers, and many of our customers have gone to get them there. You know? So let's go and take a look and see what is it that they're doing right, you know, and learn from them. And when the Dalai Lama is asking, you guys have been living without a homeland for nearly 2,000 years, and you are still not lost, as it were, in the soup of the world, that means something. I need to learn from you. So do you understand how we are looking over the fence? This is going to be the, the issue that I want to explore when we get to, to high ecumenism. Next week, I want to look again at the issue of what it means that Earth is waking up. What is this thing that, that we are finding out about natural living and about organismic, one organic? I want to urge all of you, this is my commercial today, to write to the FDA that the standards that they are ready to, to scotch for the sake of, of big business, that you will not be able to advertise a higher standard of organic than the lousy standard that they want to impose. That's not good. Um, and uh, I would like to see a kind of echo kosher uh, thing established. Uh, and I'm going to write to them as a, with a threat. If you aren't going to do it legally, then I'm going to do it bec because the state and religion, you know, don't have business together. So there will be now an echo kosher stamp that will say, your highest grade is still not measuring up to that. Uh, do, do you understand? I feel this is stuff that's necessary. I want to mention it now. If you write letters, it's a time to write that letter so that we can fix the world and get on with it. Thank you. See you next time.